DX12 introduces Shader Model 5.1, which is supported by all DX12 hardware. What that means is that support for Shader Model 5.1 doesn't depend on what the hardware's feature level is. As a side note, all DX12 hardware supports feature level of at least 11.0. Shadow Model 5.1 is basically the same as 5.0 with the exception of one major new feature and that is that Shadow Model 5.1 allows indexing of arrays of descriptors from within a shader. These descriptors being indexed are within ranges in a descriptor table and what that means is that these descriptors uh, are descriptors in a descriptor heap. Now the maximum number of descriptors that can be in a range in a descriptor table is uh, dependent on the resource binding tier of the hardware and descriptor type. You can see the full definition in the resource binding tier table listed elsewhere. But as an example, consider SRVs where on resource binding tier one, the maximum size range in a descriptor table is 128 descriptors. By contrast, resource binding tier 2 and above hardware supports uh, an array of SRVs that fills the entire descriptor heap, which can be up to a million descriptors in size. Descriptor arrays in HLSL are declared in the obvious way using brackets. The register attribute provides the logical connection between resource declarations in the program and the outside, in other words, where to find the resource through a root signature. The actual name register is quite unfortunate as a legacy name. Perhaps something better would have been something like linkage or link name. Because these T's, B's, U's, and S's don't have any physical resource behind them, nothing like a register. They're really just a name for linkage. In this example, declaring four descriptors in an array, T3 is the name for the first descriptor in the range. And so with an array of four, the names T3 through T6 are consumed by this array. So the responsibility of the root signature is to, is to declare at least, uh, to declare some range that contains at least the names T3 through T6. This example illustrates one way to do that. Here's a descriptor table declaration that includes three descriptor ranges. It starts with a constant buffer view range of size 1 that fills in HLSL register B1. It's followed by 99 SRV descriptors in a range and it's ended by another constant buffer view range of size 1 mapping to B2. Since the SRV range starts at T0, that means the names T0 through T98 are represented in this descriptor table, which is more than enough for what TEX1 requires. Accessing resources that have been declared as arrays is as straightforward as indexing them using any variable in a shader. There is, however, an important constraint on these index values, and that is that they're not allowed to vary within a draw or dispatch. Even changing the index based on instancing would count as varying. If you do vary the index within uh, a draw or dispatch, the results are undefined. That's the default behavior. Now, if you really do need to vary index values, what you need to do is specify the non-uniform resource index qualifier on the index. On some hardware, that causes special code, code to be generated that enables uh, divergence in the indices across neighboring threads uh, that, that are running in lockstep in, in the hardware. Uh, so, so there's a slight uh, inefficiency there, but it, it also provides correctness. Now, you know, you don't want to take that inefficiency if you know you're going to have uniform accesses. The reason that the default is uh, uniform access 
is it's assumed that this will be uh, the most common case. This is just a quick point about where descriptor arrays can be in memory. They can only be backed by a descriptor heap memory. In other words, there's no support for arrays of root descriptors. The reason for that is that the implementation of root arguments on some hardware isn't array friendly. I'll go over a couple of subtleties with descriptor arrays here. Recall that when descriptor tables are declared as a sequence of descriptor ranges, the last range in the table is allowed to have the num descriptors be declared as unbounded. The HLSL code that would match that would be this empty bracket syntax. Now there's also a couple of other valid configurations. You could declare an unbounded size array in your HLSL code and that would be valid to match with a root signature that had a fixed size num descriptors for the matching range. The other way around is also valid. You could declare an array of fixed size in HLSL even though the root signature declares that the array size is unbounded. Multi-dimensional arrays can also be declared and they simply get flattened out in the register linkage space. How do texture arrays compare to descriptor arrays? Texture arrays have been around since DirectX 10. With a single view or descriptor, you can get at all the slices in the array. The major constraint on texture arrays being that for all the array slices, the format, width, height, and number of MIPS has to match. In addition, all the array slices occupy a contiguous range in the virtual address space. Here's an example of accessing a texture array from a shader. The last component in the coordinate is the array index. It's a floating point value that's rounded to int on array access. The index value can vary freely without any need for qualifiers or attributes like this non-uniform resource index attribute, which is actually required with descriptor arrays when their index varies anywhere within a draw or dispatch. Going from texture arrays to descriptor arrays, the array index moves out of the coordinate to the brackets after the resource. What you get with descriptor arrays is more flexibility with the dimensions. So while the view type has to be consistent across all of the descriptors in the array, so texture 2D for all the descriptors in this example, everything else can vary for each descriptor, like the format, the width, height, number of MIPS in each descriptor. Descriptor arrays and texture arrays are actually orthogonal features in the sense that you can have a descriptor array of texture arrays, as is shown here. In order for HLSL to support descriptor arrays of constant buffers, a new syntax was required for Shader Model 5.1. There's a constant buffer type that's templatized with a user-defined struct. Doing so allows the struct to be declared in an array the constant buffer type can even be used with non-arrays if you want. So then accessing the constant buffer array is as simple as the typical array index on the struct followed by the member. By contrast, the old constant buffer syntax is still supported, but you can see why it wouldn't support arrays because every member of the constant buffer declaration was a global that is accessed directly. There's a constraint in the way descriptor arrays can be laid out in HLSL that's worth mentioning. What you can do is declare a bunch of arrays of individual descriptors, as you can see here. One way that you could lay these descriptors out in a descriptor heap would look like this. What you can't do is declare a struct containing individual descriptors and then declare an array of that struct that you could then index from within the shader. 
this would have allowed you to arrange your descriptors in a descriptor heap like this and then index the entire struct as a unit. The small advantage to this might be that if you do if you can measure the latency of the descriptor access in memory, there might be a small savings in being able to have neighbor descriptors that you will access close to each other in the program be co-located in memory. A mitigation to this is that is supported in HLSL is to forego the dynamic indexing from within the shader and so instead of declaring a struct and array and an array just simply declare the individual uh, descriptors and just use uh, descriptor tables to uh, point to these. So you could still have this memory layout and you use descriptor table pointers, or in this case just a single descriptor table pointer, uh, can give you access to the individual chunk of descriptors that you want. But what you can't do here is change this descriptor table pointer from within the shader. You, you set this outside the draw or dispatch on the command list. Shader model 5.1 has the notion of register spaces. This isn't a hardware feature, rather it's a language construct there to help improve the linkage flexibility between root signatures and shaders. The vanilla register attribute in HLSL gives you the names, in the case of shader resource views, T0 to T uint max that you can use for connecting uh, declarations and shaders to declarations and root signature. What the register space does is turn that into a two-dimensional namespace. So by default, uh, by omission, the register space is space zero. But if you choose to add the space qualifier, you can do something like this. In this example, we have two resources declared both using T0, but one of them has space one, so it doesn't conflict. One of the things that this lets you do is have different components in your software that can independently define or use up the namespace. So each component, you don't have to try to reserve ranges of the T registers across components. Each one can just have its own space to work with. The more important use for register spaces is for the fact that Shader Model 5.1 allows for very large or even unbounded arrays to be declared. In this example, Text3 is an unbounded size array whose beginning is bind slot T4. So what, what this uses up in the register namespace is T4 through T uint max in space zero. So that's pretty much all the space. So what if you want to declare more stuff? Well, you've got T0 to T3, that's only four slots, but what if you have you know, all kinds of uh, extra bindings you want to declare, potentially other arrays. So using space, in this case, T8 is declared with space one. That doesn't conflict with the T8 that's in space zero. This next pair of slides shows how to make sense of the way resources are named in the disassembly of a compiled shader model 5.1 shader. Recall that the FXC tool can print out the disassembly of a shader as a convenience so you can get a sense of what the compiler did to your shader. To start, here's an example HLSL program that declares a few textures, t text 0, text 1, and text 2, and a sampler, samp0. Note the register bind names, t5, t10, T0 space 1 and S5. What you'll see next is 
these names in the disassembly preamble followed by alternative names that are actually used in the actual disassembly and an explanation for why there's two sets of names. Here's the disassembly of the compiled shader model 5.1 program. Preamble followed by declarations followed by the actual code. You'll notice at the top right of the preamble there's an HLSL bind column. That shows the bind names that came from the original program. To the right of that there's a column count. That shows the array sizes of each variable. For example, text 1 was declared as an unbounded size array and text 2 was declared as uh, an array of size 8. The ID column is interesting. It's the, you'll see that there's all new all caps names that are replacing the HLSL by names. So the ID names are the names that are, are local to this disassembly and the bytecode. Looking further below in the declarations area, you'll see the declarations list these names in the same order that they show up up in the preamble. So it's sort of easy to track between the two. The reason that new names are provided uh, and used uh, locally is to disambiguate cases where there's potentially more than one array and allow for call sites to not have to use qualifiers like space, for example. So in this case, instead of saying T0 space 1, we can just say T2. And you, on the right over here, you can see an example of a reference from the shader. Looking back at the declarations, you'll notice that every resource appears as if it's an array, whether it's an array or not. So for example, the sampler up at the top S5 was not an array, it's just a count of, of one. But you see in the declaration, it shows up as S0 bracket five colon five. The five colon five illustrates the array range that the bytecode is going to use to pick the sampler. Since it's size one, it's only going from five to five. And the interesting choice of this number is that it actually matches the uh, the number from the original HLSL program, S5. So basically, the number space within the brackets for all resource accesses in the bytecode is the actual number space that the application chose in its program. And now looking at the at the right side at individual call sites, you can see that for the sites that aren't actually arrays, uh, the in the brackets you can actually tell what the original HLSL binding was, lowercase t5. Uh, in, or this was, sorry, lowercase s5, and this would be lowercase t5. Wh whenever a shader, uh, a call site is doing dynamic indexing, such as in these two examples, you'll see that the literal value, 10 at the bottom and, and 0 for t2 here, always matches the lowercase t binding from HLSL. So for uppercase T1, inside the brackets you see 10 is added to the index. And so what that means is that the range of values being indexed is a match for the binding range from the HLSL program. In this example, T10 and above. That's it. Thanks for listening. I hope you found this useful, and I'm excited to see what you create with the new low-level graphics APIs. Happy bindings!